In addition to Corona, Brexit is also causing problems for many companies. Experts explain the current situation. Great Britain has officially left the European Union for three and a half months. The effect of this are now slowly becoming apparent. For example, German exports to Great Britain have collapsed. The Federal Statistical Office has stated that a decrease of around 30% is expected for January 2021 compared to the same month of the previous year. I reported on that in other videos. After Great Britain left not only the EU, but also the customs union and the internal market, tariffs have been due in some industries since January. Goods checks are also carried out and in, on the EU side, not on the UK side. With all the discussions about Brexit, the agreement was a fair one, said David McAllister, EU member of the Christian Democratic Union in Germany and chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs in the European Parliament at an event of the Economic Council of the Christian Democratic Union, the CDU, Baden-Württemberg. The alternative would have been a disorderly exit from the EU, with all the devastating consequences for citizens and companies, said the politician. But he also made it clear, there can and will no longer be a smooth trade as before. As I said in another video, David McAllister also gave a few details about it in his uh, response to my request. I just sent a request like every other EU citizen can to an MEP. For example, that there is currently no date for ratification, but also that there are currently 17 committees in the European Parliament dealing with the treaty. No agreement would have had a negative impact on the mood between the EU and Great Britain for many years to come, said Dr. Ulrich Hoppe, Managing Director of the German-British Chamber of Commerce and Industry. And how was the economy prepared for Brexit? McAllister said that he had the impression that the British government had failed to prepare the companies for leaving the EU. German companies, on the other hand, would have known better what to prepare for, partly because of the um, trade and uh, industry chambers. In practice, however, Brexit is still having an impact on companies, as the example of Trump, for example, shows. The Ditzingen-based company has three locations in Great Britain with an annual turnover of around 140 million euros. In addition to sales, it is also about the production of laser generators and components, the company explained. We are currently registering an increase in incoming orders throughout the group with growth rates compared to the previous year. However, sales are still lagging behind for various reasons, said Trumpf. Due to the pandemic, for example, machines or corresponding parts cannot always de be delivered to the customer at the desired speed. Freight capacities are globally limited and quarantine regulations mean that some containers have to be parked for days. With a view to Brexit, Trump felt a double burden from the exit from the EU and the corona pandemic at the beginning of the year. They say customs clearance costs additional time that customers don't have when ordering. Spare parts are not coming in properly, which affects the supply chain, reports the company. In the area of technical services too, Trumpf expects additional restrictions as a result of Brexit. For example, when fitters and service technicians travel. And further, the time lost could develop into a bottleneck both in the movement of goods and in the services for our machines. Cross-border trade and services will become more difficult in the future, explains Hoppe. And the reason for this is visa restrictions. He also sees the smaller companies as the losers of Brexit, for whom the British market will no longer be worthwhile due to the additional costs caused by more formalities. He also expects prices to rise, which will hit UK consumers in particular. According to foreign trade expert Mark Lehnfeld from Germany Trade and Invest, the GTAI, the Brexit uncertainty will continue to burden German-British trade. The urgently needed optimism is still missing, he told um, the German press agency in London. 
Last year, the Brexit, but also the Corona crisis, had left their mark on trade between Germany and Great Britain. German exports to the UK um, fell year on year by 15.5% to 66.9 billion euros. That was the sharpest decline since the financial and economic crisis in 2009, where it was 17%, so not, not much higher. Nevertheless, there are signs that speak for stabilization, said Lehnfeld. The expert named last week's decision by the British government to postpone the expansion of customs controls by six months to January 2022 as an important step, although an illegal one, I say. Also positive for them, the conditions for German exporters are good because the corona burden on the economy is dwindling and the British economy is picking up speed again, Lehnfeld said. There are good sales opportunities in certain industries. He says, a strong expansion of the offshore wind energy business in the kingdom, which is already the largest offshore wind market in the world, high investments in new state hospitals and transport infrastructure programs worth billions make the island attractive even with a customs border, said the expert. The trade will therefore settle in again, but the level remains questionable. Brexit and, of course, the corona pandemic also have an impact on the mood in companies. More than half, that's 54%, assume that sales will decline in 2021. 31% even expect a sharp decline. This is the result of the German-British Business Outlook 2021, the annual survey by the British Chamber of Commerce in Germany and the auditing company KPMG. For comparison, in the previous year, only 30% of those surveyed expected Brexit-related declines in sales and 5% expected strong declines, though there is a huge different, um, difference between what they expected last year before January 1st came and before the TCA was there and now. And other um, areas are hit hard as well. And there are some areas almost nobody knows anything about. And one of them is state aid. State aid is perhaps a lesser known area of the EU competition law, but in the run up to the conclusion of Brexit negotiations that resulted in the trade and cooperation agreement on Christmas Eve, the term became common parlance as one of the final sticking points in the EU-UK negotiations. State aid should already be familiar as a concept to companies in the UK and elsewhere that rely on government support to carry out their activities. State aid support schemes in the UK include, among others, renewable energy subsidies to generators under the Contract for Differences, the CFD, and capacity market schemes, grants for training schemes, and more recently, some of the COVID-19 support that has been used to prop up ailing companies suffering the ill effects of the pandemic, including, for example, the Coronavirus Business Interruption Loan Scheme, the CBILS, launched in March 2020. In the EU-UK negotiations, one of the key conundrums was how to reconcile the EU's desire to ensure the UK was satisfactorily constrained from subsidizing its own industries in a manner that would not unfairly advantage them over their EU competitors, that means ensuring a level playing field. The famous words were the UK's determination to forge its own path once it was no longer bound by EU state aid rules. The compromise reached in the TCA was that the UK will need to design its own domestic subsidy control regime in the coming months, but that regime will need to achieve compliance with a set of principles that are drawn from the EU state aid rulebook. The UK regime remains to be developed with a consultation by the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, the BEIS, on design options due to close on March 31st. However, we can elicit some of the main features of the regime from the TCA. State aid as a term will be abandoned in the UK going forward, with the TCA focusing on the grant of subsidies. However, the definition of a subsidy in the TCA 
broadly replicates all the key features associated with state aid. So th this could be a question of form over substance. However, one cannot exclude differences emerging over time as the courts are called upon to interpret these terms. As part of the new subsidy regime design, the UK will be free to define assessment criteria and other guidance. None of us knows, however, that the ultimate goal will be to demonstrate that any UK subsidy conforms to the six principles defined in the TCA. These mirror the assessment criteria that the European Commission applies to the assessment of state aid measures. They, for example, they must pursue a, st a specific public policy objective to remedy a market failure and comply with considerations such as proportionality, necessity, incentive effect, and their positive contributions must outweigh the negative effects on trade and competition. One obvious absence in the TCA is any commitment by the UK to institute an ex-ante approval system. The EU state aid regime operates on the principle that unless an exemption applies, state aid cannot legally be granted until it is formally approved. This requirement has not been replicated in the TCA, which means that the UK is free to design a regime that does not require prior approval for a subsidy to be granted. However, as under EU state aid rules, the TCA envisages that in the UK there will be the possibility for interested parties, and that's typically competitors to aid beneficiaries, to challenge the grant of subsidy and obtain an effective remedy, including the suspension of the measure, an award of damages, and or the recovery of the subsidy by the grantor. In practice, such private enforcement of the subsidy rules could be as significant as enforcement by the relevant authority. Like the EU regime, the TCA con contemplates extra conditions for certain sectors. For example, there are extra conditions applicable to subsidies for banks, credit institutions and insurance companies, including rescue and restructuring measures, export subsidies, energy and environment measures, and to air carriers for the operation of certain routes. While the EU also imposes more specific conditions on airports, railways, maritime transport, research, development and innovation, broadband, broadband deployment and public passenger transport by road and rail, the UK is not required to do so under the TCA, although it will be free to develop its own sectoral conditions if it chooses. It is also notable that the subsidy rules under the TCA do not apply to the audiovisual sector. This is one area in which we might expect the UK to adopt targeted guidance on how compliance with those conditions can be achieved in affected sectors, but that is all still to come. So what does this mean for UK businesses in the interim? Support that meets the subsidy criteria can still be granted, certainly. The practical effect of the absence of a legislative regime means that it will be down to the local authority or other subsidy granting entity to determine if the subsidy they are granting is compliant with the TCA. To do this, they will need to refer to the six principles. In practice, most UK public bodies that grant subsidies are likely to continue to refer to EU state aid rules as a yardstick until the new regime is adopted. There are practical issues with this approach, however. With respect to COVID-19 support in particular, the EU rules under the EU temporary framework have evolved since Brexit. For example, the €800,000 ceiling that used to apply to direct grants to individual companies has been raised again to 1.8 million euros. Other ceilings have also been raised. No doubt the UK authorities would not consider it appropriate for local authorities and other bodies to track the iterative changes to the EU rules in the interim, but that does leave public bodies somewhat on their own until the new regime emerges with more definite guidance. 
the long-term impact with respect to practicalities and procedures will not emerge until the UK's new legislation is adopted. <clears throat> there are particular points where changes can be expected. Of particular note will be whether the UK decides to mirror the EU's ex-ante approach. It seems like the, the UK will not do so, given the apparent lack associated with the introduction of the new regime. Indeed, if it were the UK's intention to mirror the EU's ex-ante position, one might expect to see the implementation of new measures announced in the interim, including those announced by the Chancellor of the Exchequer in his March 2021 budget, delayed until the procedures were enacted. There is no indication the UK intends to do this at present. So we'll all have to see a move to more generalized approval mechanic, possibly based on ex post review or more generalized expansions, exemptions. Ultimately, however, this all remains to be seen. Whether the new regime relies on pre-approvals or not, the UK will also need to designate an independent body to administer the, the regime. But nothing is there yet. Although the Competition and Markets Authority, the CMA, is the obvious candidate and was also the body designated to fulfill that function under the 2019 Brexit deal that was previously rejected by the UK Parliament. This would represent a substantial new mandate for the CMA, which is already expecting a huge increase in its merger control and antitrust enforcement workloads as a result of Brexit. The government has remained notably circumspect, however, on whether the CMA will indeed get the nod. And there are other candidates, but everything else would also be speculation at the moment. And so it remains to be seen how the UK government will deal with this and will deal with this part of the TCA. But I thought it's time to talk about this again because the TCA is that long and there are a lot of small things hidden people never cared about that they should be named as well. And if you want to stay informed, please subscribe to my channel. Auf Wiedersehen.